Hey, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Let's do an audience poll. Who here owns cryptocurrency? OK, a bunch of hands. Who here is thinking about buying cryptocurrency? OK, everybody who owns it, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty even split. Nobody else who doesn't is thinking about it. But uh, all right, so just by way of introductions, Dom, Definity, you are calling yourselves the internet computer, uh, basically a decentralized cloud platform that relies on blockchain uh, where you have servers across different data centers. So it's sort of a decentralized data center and that is part of the, the foundation of what you're trying to do in terms of potentially disrupting some of these big tech giants, whether that's Salesforce or LinkedIn. You're talking about de decentralized versions of these big social, social media companies or Amazon companies like that. Joe, you are a co-founder of Ethereum. You also run Consensus, which is a blockchain development company. Um, but tell me, you know, thinking about Ethereum, which right now is the second leading cryptocurrency, was this a goal, you know, when you started Ethereum, because you hear a lot of people talk with blockchain about disrupting banks versus disrupting big tech. How, what, were, what was, was that part of it when, when you started Ethereum, you know, thinking about potentially the new, a different type of Facebook, a different kind of Google, or how did that play into your vision? Sure, um, so Bitcoin essentially uh, invented a couple of things. It invented this next generation decentralized database and something called crypto economics and a token um, that uh, via mechanism design and crypto economics would incentivize people uh, to essentially create a, a money. It was of the people, by the, by the people, and for the people. And uh, in that way, essentially um, build a maximally decentralized trust system. Uh, and so in 2012, uh, many people came along and said, we should be using this kind of database infrastructure for everything. Uh, and so. Uh, of that, Ethereum was born, and uh, we built essentially um, what, uh, what we then called uh, a world computer. Uh, and um, many since then, including us at Dark Company Consensus, have built tools and infrastructure uh, and have been building in different verticals um, to uh, essentially do uh, some of the things that uh, the DOM is intending to do, uh, where we do go after uh, these um, um, major services on the internet, um, but it's also much more than that because we're bringing um, a new trust foundation, we're building a, a global settlement layer, and we're able to build a new kind of financial plumbing where we can issue, we've issued uh, um, essentially billions of dollars worth of digital assets on that platform. Yeah, Dom, so the idea of an internet computer, I mean, we already have the internet, we already have Amazon Web Services. We already have Ethereum. <coughs> Why do we need Definity, the internet computer? Um, so uh, the internet computer is reinventing the internet as a computer that um, can host and run secure software with sort of range of superpowers. Um, and these address uh, problems, major problems that are stalking tech today. So uh, it's intended as a complete replacement to the sort of uh, $3.6 trillion legacy IT stack um, and addresses major issues um, such as the difficulty of creating secure IT infrastructure. Um, it also address, addresses um, uh, the difficulties we have with the monopolization of the internet today and provides a platform to create a new breed of open internet services that will provide a better platform for you know, innovation, entrepreneurialism, investment, and so on going forwards. So the idea, I mean, decentralization, we, you know, to create a decentralized version of some of these you know, huge tech companies, is there any evidence that a decentralized organization, you might not even call it a company, could rise to that level where it could actually challenge that dominance? I mean, the only example that I can think of is Wikipedia, and it's not even, there's, you know, it's not even competing on the same level. So the most powerful um, force in tech uh, is network effects. And uh, the increasing monopolization of the internet is kind of driven by network effects. So um, one approach to deal with that increasing monopolization of the internet is to uh, you know, bring in antitrust uh, regulation and so on and, and try and break up big tech. Um, the internet computer provides an alternative means to address the increasing monopolization of the internet. 
uh, by providing a platform for the creation of open internet services. Um, an open internet service uh, you can think of as being something roughly analogous to an open source project um, where uh, the service itself has its independent, exist an independent existence and is managed by a decentralized governance system. Um, most of all, these things provide a means to address something called platform risk. So an early example, uh, or harbinger of what was to come, was provided by Zynga. You know, Zynga built on Facebook. Uh, they IPO'd, they're a very successful company. Facebook changed the rules. A few months later, they lost 85% of their value. Scroll forwards to today. Uh, 18 of the last 22 tech IPOs uh, mention uh, platform risk as existential threats in their S1 filings. And the problem is, if you build on the APIs, and if you build on top of big tech, um, you're building on sand. You know, you just can't trust it. And for example, recently, um, hundreds of startups, uh, well, a few years ago now, had, had their access to uh, LinkedIn revoked. And um, open internet services will provide a way to create, for example, open WhatsApp, open LinkedIn, open Salesforce. Um, Taking LinkedIn for an example, an open LinkedIn would become part of the fabric of the internet itself and would be able to guarantee that its APIs would never ever be removed or revoked. So that um, entrepreneurs uh, and investors wanting to build new internet services that needed to incorporate business profiles can securely build on top of open LinkedIn. And this will create a kind of mutualized network effect, which will drive the uh, development of the open internet forward very rapidly, in, in my opinion. Who is going to build it? So, so the, the idea is to essentially build on protocol-based open platforms. If you're uh, building on Facebook, you're building on a platform that somebody else controls, and uh, they're probably, at, towards the end of their monetization cycle, they're probably going to end up having to eat your lunch. Mm. Um, and if you're building on TCP IP, which is a, a protocol, um, then you can be relatively certain that, uh, that that's not going to shift out from under you for competitive reasons. So um, Web 3.0, uh, which will be the evolution of where we are right now, Web 2.0, will be lots of decentralized open platforms. It'll be platforms like Ethereum for trusted transactions, automated agreements. It'll be platforms like Definity. It'll be platforms for decentralized storage, decentralized bandwidth, decentralized heavy compute, decentralized identity. And all of these things, um, we can have the governance discussion uh, soon, all of these things are currently uh, contemplating uh, massively decentralized governance, and, and that um, uh, plays out in a lot of different dimensions. Is there a business case, though, that you incentivize the building of this? I mean, you know, if, you don't, if it's decentralized, you don't have a CEO, it's not a company. Does it, yep. is, is it only nonprofits who can do this? Uh, no, um, protocol-based open platforms uh, with this new invention uh, of Satoshi called crypto economics um, enable the issuance of a token uh, and uh, effective mechanism design so that lots of different actors can pursue their selfish interests, uh, perform different roles, uh, and achieve the goals of the system. So you can achieve um, decentralized governance um, while still um, enabling people to pursue their own interests. Can you make money doing it, though? Absolutely. I mean, put, put, put it this way. If you were an entrepreneur and you wanted to build uh, a new business service that needed to incorporate business profiles, would you rather build on top of closed proprietary LinkedIn? I mean, you haven't even got that choice anymore because it's already closed all the APIs down. Uh, the only people with API access to uh, LinkedIn, I mean, Salesforce, WeChat, Microsoft, and so on. But let's say closed proprietary LinkedIn uh, still provided APIs. Who would you rather build on? Closed proprietary LinkedIn or open LinkedIn that guaranteed um, your foundations were solid and would never revoke your, your, your access and break your service, as LinkedIn did to hundreds of startups? What would you rather build on? That's the reason the open internet will succeed and triumph over the closed proprietary internet. And, there's enormous numbers of uh, engineers and researchers leaving places like Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, um, partly because the technology is very interesting, but also because they believe in um, sort of taking the internet back to its roots, making it more open, creative, innovative, providing a better platform for entrepreneurs and investors. Um, there's a huge movement, uh, which of course is um, partly uh, represented by the success of things like uh, Ethereum and so on. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's not going away. It's a part of a major transition to a different model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to come to questions in a minute. So get them ready, raise your hands. They'll bring you a microphone. But you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Ethereum, you know, because it's the second leading cryptocurrency, um, which had this terrible crash, crypto winner, all of that. It started to bounce back this year, so Bitcoin's up about 160%. Ethereum's lagged a bit. It's about, only about, about 60%, still good, but you know, it hasn't had um, the same bounce back that Bitcoin has. And you're, I know you're still trying to scale. There's still questions about that. You are planning to launch Ethereum 2.0 um, starting early next year. You've also had some restructuring at consensus a bit too with some headcount reduction. But it, I guess you know, in terms of scale, how, is this a technology that really can rise to the level where it could replace you know, these huge platforms, Google, Amazon, some of the others? Yeah, so it's fair to say that uh... Uh, Ethereum is the second largest cryptocurrency if you only look at that dimension, but it's by far the largest blockchain ecosystem mm -hmm. if you look at uh, the number of developers and the number of projects that are building on the platform. Um, uh, we have scaled enormously even uh, during crypto winter. Um, so many of the people who were focused on the more speculative aspects uh, related to Bitcoin or related to Ether or related to the many tokens that were launched on the Ethereum platform. Um, some of those projects worked out well, many of them worked out quite badly and a lot of the speculators have fled. Some of the speculators are coming back at, at this point uh, as we've seen. Uh, but all through that, the technologists, the entrepreneurs that have been drawn into the Ethereum ecosystem have stayed. Uh, once you see uh, the value of decentralization and building systems in different ways. You can't unsee that. You can't really go back to, to building on Web2 architectures. And so um, throughout that period, uh, our ecosystem has grown enormously. Um, throughout that period, enterprise usage of our ecosystem, we work in many different verticals, um, has gone uh, grown exponentially. And so um, we've seen, even on a, a transaction basis, uh, uh, the hit on Ethereum is that it can handle around 20 transactions per second, but that's at layer one, at the base trust layer. Mm -hmm. At layer two, where we have many different technologies that anchor into layer one for enhanced trust, we're seeing tens and hundreds of thousands of decentralized transactions coming online on exchanges and games, et cetera. And so scalability is already here, and it's going to be here in spades when we release uh, Ethereum 2, uh, which get started in its release uh, early next year. Yeah, thanks. Any questions in the audience? Do we have any? See a hand in the back, please. Yes. Hi, Jeff Roberts, Fortune. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about governance, which you sort of alluded to but didn't explain. If you're a decentralized governance, how can you build something that will take on Google and Facebook? Because a lot of people say Ethereum governance has been dysfunctional. It's been years to create basic scaling, and what exactly are you going to do to put in a governance structure people can understand and possibly participate in? Yeah, so the theory of decentralization is a very powerful one, uh, but it does require good governance like everything else on the planet, and uh, as I think we would all agree, governance is difficult. Um, governance of decentralized platforms uh, is a new thing that we're trying to figure out. I, I feel like the Ethereum Foundation governance has been excellent. I, I believe that... Uh, uh, we launched uh, an unprecedented platform in uh, about a year and a half and have continued to improve it and, and have pioneered uh, an architecture that will scale it um, enormously uh, and essentially end up being a, a base trust layer uh, for the planet. Um, governance on the Ethereum project is different from Definity, different from uh, Polkadot uh, in that we are uh, focusing on having lots of different actors in different roles who are all incentivized to make the platform better, uh, have voice, uh, and I like the idea of more automated governance. Uh, there will be governance uh, by token votes, and we already do some of that, um, but uh, there are projects, and Dom can take it from here, there are projects that are contemplating building layers and layers of governance uh, of these platforms. And I think uh, it's going to take years to figure all that out. Uh, Ethereum will do the same thing um, slowly and prudently. Uh, but even without that, uh, I believe that uh, many different actors all committed to improving the platform. 
uh, will be able to challenge the big entities who have a, perhaps a smaller number of highly incentivized actors. And uh, as we get the layers of governance um, right over time, um, it'll be a foundation for many kinds of systems on the planet. John, how are you <coughs> thinking about governance? Yeah, so um, uh, the internet, of course, has not-for-profit governance uh, organizations like IANA, um, which you know give you your ASN number and IP addresses and so on if you're an ISP. Um, the internet computer uh, has automated algorithmic governance systems um, that serve both to ensure the internet computer network, um, which is comprised from independent data centers, uh, remains open. It's also um, a key part of the means we use to address platform risk, which is so important. Uh, with respect to the second part of the question, how can we um, compete with uh, you know, giant organizations like Google and Facebook, um, the DFINITY Foundation's strategy um, is to apply enormous resources to R&D. Um, although it's a not-for-profit organization, it operates, uh, really uses the Silicon Valley playbook. Uh, we've got research centers currently in Zurich, uh, Palo Alto, and, and San Francisco. There are um, more going live soon. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hiring the very, world's very best researchers and engineers and using the best engineering research practices we can um, to deliver internet computer technologies. So in that sense, uh, um, although it's a not-for-profit, um, we work in exactly the same way. And indeed, you know, we've been successfully um, hiring some of the very brightest and best senior but, um, people from, from places like Google. So The thing, I mean, you know, w with Facebook, you know, if somebody, if they wanted to, they could ban somebody from their platform. If Google, you know, somebody submits an ad that's fraudulent or a phishing scam, they can ban from the platform. What do you do about bad actors? I mean, what is your power or what's the network's power? So that's a, um, a difference between the internet computer and something like Ethereum. So the internet computer does have, uh, the network has an onboard uh, open governance system and it is capable of uh, neutralizing bad actors. Um, there's debate about you know, whether that's a good or a bad thing. Perhaps um, many <laughs> libertarians think bad actors should be tolerated. Um, and you know, I wouldn't want to, uh, I don't really have a firm position on that, but we do have the technological means to address that kind of thing. Yeah, so from the start, the Ethereum project assumed that uh, the vast majority of apps, um, transactions on the network, uh, would be valuable because they would be between um, significantly identified or fully identified actors. Uh, we've built infrastructure that enables us to issue digital assets in many different countries with full identity checks, uh, AML, KYC, et cetera. Um, and so we're bringing identity and reputation uh, to these applications. But um, it, it's, a, it's a deep philosophical issue. Um, yes or no? Should, should yes. we have a base trust layer that is permissionless, um, or should we have one uh, that is essentially censorable uh, by government actors? It's a, it's a powerful technology in uh, our society. Uh, our different jurisdictions of our society are gonna have to have those discussions and fit the technology in with their belief systems. Your personal belief, <laughs> yes or no, bad actors should be tolerated, yes or no? Um, that's a, that's a difficult question. Okay. I, I would say generally no, uh, but who yeah. defines the bad actor? Yeah, no, it's a question we'll have to, it's a, it's a longer discussion. That's all the time we have, but uh, thank you both so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks.